I'm going to California where the sleep I ever night. Going to California where the sleep I ever night. I'm leaving you, Mama, cause you ain't been treating me right. I'm a direct descendant of Richard Pace, who landed in Virginia in 1610. My name is Nathaniel Pace. Uh, Richard Pace had a plantation over near Surrey called Pace's Pain. There's a highway sign there to this day sh showing this. My ancestors moved south and west and other parts of the Pace clan moved west. I have a friend in California, Denny, Dr. Denny Pace. And I was in World War II, I was a Marine Raider, and we had four Paces in the Raider battalions, one from Missouri, one from Indiana, one from California, and myself. I was born in Mississippi in 1925 on April the 1st. Now, when I was 17 years old and footloose and fancy free, I didn't like the farm any longer. <laughs> I joined the Marine Corps and my 18th birthday was a pleasure. I had that in New Zealand, which is really a small paradise. <laughs> my worst memories of the war was my 20th birthday, the day we landed on Okinawa the bloodiest campaign of the Pacific, although I had been through three campaigns before that. The tail end of Guadalcanal, which only I uh, was subject to some bombing, no close fighting, I was too late for that. But from Guadalcanal, I went to Bougainville. And from Bougainville, back to Guadalcanal. I tell my wife sometime that when I was in the islands in the Pacific, that going home meant to go into Bougainville, I mean to Guadalcanal. That's where we went for training and regrouping. I joined the Raider Battalion on Guadalcanal, the second Raiders, Carlson's Raiders, and fought Bougainville, a little island of Emeru, and all of Guam, and all of Okinawa, and then into the invasion in Japan. The Raider Battalions were famous, there was four of them, I was in the 2nd and 4th. The 2nd Raider Battalion was formed and run by Colonel Carlson, who came up with the term gung-ho. And that's known all over the world now, meaning work together. It's a Chinese thing. He was very familiar with, uh, uh, Chang, uh, with Mao, Mao Zedong. He traveled with his army for a while and studied him at the direction of President Roosevelt. Roosevelt had a good State Department to bring him information, but he wanted the truthful, factual information, and I understand that Carlson was sent to do that in China. He had great respect from his men, and that's, he was known for being a good military leader. Bougainville was my first campaign with the Raiders, and it was very scary. I was quite afraid, and I saw my first dead Japanese and it was a shock. I realized, hey, this is serious, <laughs> serious business we're in. And one day, I was at the edge of a foxhole about 10 feet from another man, a friend of mine named Ford. And we heard the mortar go off, the Japanese mortar, and we knew how long it took them usually to land. We could count. We counted. It didn't go off. We figured it was a dud or went in another direction. So we raised back up. Well, what it was, it was a bigger mortar that we weren't used to, fired from further back. And just as we raised up, the mortar caught Ford right in the middle. And he was just disintegrated all over the landscape and all over me. I couldn't eat fresh meat for a long time after that. The smell of human flesh was all over me. That was my first and worst uh, incident in World War II. Well, I've stayed with the Marines until the war was over. I was on Guam when the bomb was dropped. Instead of going back to Guadalcanal, we went back to Guam after Okinawa. And uh, the bomb was dropped, uh, surrender, and we went to Japan. It was weary. <laughs> 
very nice little place we went to. It hadn't been bombed, but most of Japan, the area I saw, was flattened, bombed. Between Yokosuka and and uh, Tokyo was bombed. I went to a rodeo put on in uh, Tokyo one day by the U.S. Army, and uh, a guy was riding the Emperor's white horse. <laughs> That's how much we had them defeated. Now, many of us had automobiles in Japan. That is, we stole automobiles. You steal one wherever you found it and took it on base and drove it until somebody took, stole it from you or took it away from you. And uh, most of the war was between campaigns and boredom. Boredom and training and uh, just a four years wasted, you might say. There's not that much campaigning in any war. You can't just fight all the time. You don't last long that way. There would be a campaign and another one, but be a different group going to a different campaign. I had a lot of warfare, I think, but there was a lot more I could have had if I had been sent to the other islands. And I, I was happy to get home, to say the least, and get out of it, and I tended to forget about it. When I went to college, nobody mentioned the war. The war was over. You, could, you were no hero. Everybody knew somebody that was in it, so you, nobody was anything. I went, uh, come back home and didn't go home to Mississippi. I went to Washington, D.C., where I had a brother living, and then enrolled at the University of Maryland. They couldn't take me. I had no high school education. So I went to Upper Marlboro, Maryland, and took exams and passed them enough to entry into the college, and I went in for four years. I made good grades. As a no background, I still made pretty good grades and was recommended to law school. I didn't go to law school then. I went later in Atlanta after I was working. <laughs> but uh, college was fairly easy for me. I had to study, but I, I, I made it pretty good. And uh, took public speaking and when I graduated, I went to Florida and took lecture tours through Ross Island's Reptile Institute, where I wrestled alligators, milked rattlesnakes, and told people about the uh, snakes and reptiles of the world. A lot of fun, and I was a good speaker, but I better I learned more speaking there than I learned in college. You've got to know what you're talking about when you're milking a rattlesnake and telling people about it. <laughs> After college, I really didn't know what I was going to do. Of course, I lived around Washington, D.C., and government jobs was a thing that a lot of people looked for when they finished school. So I took exams in Baltimore, Maryland, for the U.S. Border Patrol. It was sometime later that I was called for it. I'd been to Florida working and been around when I got called to a point. And I was stationed, I was sent to my first duty station at El Centro, California. And I worked there for about two years at the little town of Brawley. And I transferred over to the coast, San Diego and Chula Vista. Better climate, better working conditions. <laughs> and uh, I taught pistol shooting primarily and did other functions for the Border Patrol. I became a master pistol shooter. Was on a team, uh, a team of four men. They are all deceased but me. One died about three months ago here in Virginia. <laughs> okay, about the music. <laughs> I took piano lessons as a kid and worked at it for a while. <clears throat> and uh, my brother, older brother, he's eight or ten years older than me. He's 94 now, lives in Tennessee. He taught me enough about the guitar. To, I call it flogging a guitar and singing with it. And I grew up, any music I heard was on the battery-operated radio. <laughs> and uh, church music. And I don't know when I got interested in it. I wasn't real interested in it. I didn't perform it during the war. There was no purpose in it. I didn't perform any in college. Uh, it was not a popular music, the music that I learned. And the big influence, of course, was Jimmy Rogers. Famous Jimmy Rogers, the yodeling uh, boy that started country music primarily in this country. <laughs> He was the leading record seller in the late 20s. He outsold everybody else in records. And I was amazed by his ability to yodel 
and tried that. And I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> I'm going to California where the sleep I ever night. Going to California where the sleep I ever night. I'm leaving you, Mama, cause you ain't been treating me right. Oh, the lady, oh, the lady, oh, the lady, oh, amazing grass, how sweet the smoke, as it swirls round inside of me, I was lost all alone, oh, but now that I get stoned, I got friends. As far as I can see Amazing grass All over the town Every kid has his own private stash Oh, the nards and the old judge For well, they sure do hold a grudge And that lawyer got all of my cash Amazing grass, I know you will like it. I made a plant in my neighbor's rose bed. Oh, the seeds I was told was like a full cold gold mixed with some pan in my red. Amazing grass. You sure do have quiet Though some folks say you're a sin I have no doubt They're gonna let me out When the parole board meets again I uh, was impressed by World War II seeing all the people killed and it began to dawn on me that the killing is directed at young adult males, the Germans and the Japs. And looking back at World War I, at the numbers of uh, British and uh, French and Germans were killed, and instead of condemning war, I began to think, well, it's a human activity that's absolutely necessary, the killing of young males. They're getting rid of them in some way. And... Uh, I put this into a book called The Excess Mail, and I wasn't published immediately, but I was after a while because I impressed the publishers with this new theory. In fact, they were worried and told me they hoped I didn't cause them to be setting up mail killing stations all over the country. No, we do that in war, getting rid of the mails. And it's, it's ridiculous, but it's a thought to think of when you think of how many men are killed at war and how much wars have gone on over a period of time. And at one time, it was absolutely atrocious, the numbers of males killed, without there being any damage to the rest of the population as a rule. And that led to publishing the excess male. My singing, I, if I ever thought of being famous as a singer, was based on the fact that I'd use that to try to put forth the theories in my book, as far as doing human beings any good, was doing limit, limiting the number of males born. Limiting the number of people born, period, is, I think, an absolute necessity. My name is Nathaniel A. Pace. I was born in Mississippi in 1925 on April the 1st. I've been known as an April Fool for 86 years. <laughs> And I met my wife while I was still in college. And uh, I worked at Sears and Roebuck for a while, and she was a supervisor there. At age 21, she was a supervisor over a, a large group of people. She was that intelligent. Uh, we got married and been married now 63 years, going on 64 years. We've lived all over. We raised two boys, and uh, everything's been good. She's a very good cook. And <laughs> that was my big trouble. <laughs> Very good cook. But I've had a good marriage, a good home life. Yeah, thank you. Jumped in the river, but the dog on the river was.
Oh, 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 oh,